Seven ways to make a man fall madly in love with you. You're, we're going to dive into this today. And before we get started, I want to address something. And that is, why do relationships fail? Or better yet, why do they end? Let's not call them failures. Let's just call them endings. And I think because there's this assumption that if you have chemistry and alignment with one another, you don't have to do any work in the relationship. It's just supposed to magically fall into place. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions and assumptions couples make in the dating, mating, and relating process. And I'm here to suggest that to approach it from a more conscious, mindful way, particularly addressing a partner's needs. What are their needs? And needs directly coincide with love. Because why are we in relationship with another human being other than I mean, let's just say maybe for some sort of financial reason, and most of us don't have that necessity because given today's environment, most people can take care of themselves. So ultimately why two people join together is to meet each other's needs and which is how we, for lack of a better word, fall in love. So what's the whole purpose of being in a relationship? I feel as though it's really getting your needs met and falling in love. So let's examine love for a moment. Let's dive into this a little bit. And if you're familiar with the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, let me pull this out for everyone. Here's the book. This is a basic understanding of how we give and receive love, how we give and receive love. Now, you might be thinking, hey, Jonathan, this book says five. But your video says seven ways to make a man fall in love with you. Well, that's what we're going to address today. Because since this book has been published, and we'll talk about the five love languages, there's been some additions. I don't know where this comes from. I want to be candid with what I'm about to share. I actually read uh, online. It's in direct correlation to the book, The Five Love Languages. But they added a couple more that I believe are critically important to the success of a relationship. And when you understand how we give and receive love, I believe we have a greater chance of relationship success. Now, earlier I said to you that relationships don't, I, don't need work if you believe that if you have chemistry and alignment. Yet the reality is, is I think work sometimes gets a bad rap. See, I believe that couples who actually nurture the relationship. In fact, treat the relationship as a separate entity. So there's a you, there's a me, and there's a collective we. The relationship is a separate entity. When you treat it as such, it's not actual work. It's actually part of our individual fulfillment and enjoyment. So re just recently, I was at a celebration for life ceremony. Many of you know, I interviewed a woman by the name of Patty Tierney, and she's a former sex worker who actually was able to overcome, or I don't know if overcome is the right word, but she recognized that her choices were made based on a lack of self-love. And she wrote a book about stepping into her heart called for a good time, surviving sex work, addiction, and to become the mother I was meant to be, Patty Tierney. And she had passed away about a month or so ago. And during her celebration of life, and during one of the remembrances people were sharing, this couple came up and shared how Patty's work and encouragement had helped their relationship. And why I'm bringing this up is, Patty and her husband, John, were actually couples counselors to help many couples find better, find ways to genuinely connect at more of a heart-centered way. And what occurs to me and what I'm about to share with you are having some base foundation, having a foundation of what it takes to actually love another human being to actually be in relationship with another human being. I think we oftentimes enter into the dating process so naive, not understanding that when we treat the, the we as a separate entity, we can actually, in many cases, have a full, rich, as I always say, juicy, delicious, healthy, happy relationship. 
Excuse me, I wanted to turn on the fan. It was getting a little hot in here. All right, so we're going to dive into the seven ways to make a man fall deeply in love with you. And again, this is based partly on the book, The Five Love Languages, but I want everyone to Google this right now, The Seven Love Languages. And we're going to go through each one of them right now. So within the book, one of the first love, or not, it's this is in no particular order, but in the book, one of the love language is quality time. But in the seven love languages, it calls the, the um, what they call it is activity, activity. If your love language is activity-based, you feel most loved and valued when you spend time doing activities with your partner. You also may feel seen and loved when your partner pays particularly particular attention to you and takes interest in your hobbies and passions. Many of you follow my work. I talk about the kind of relationship I seek in my life. I seek the kind of relationship where we spend three or four days and nights a week together doing shared activities, hobbies, mutual interest, spending time with family and friends, traveling together, teamwork building skills, both in our personal and our professional life, intimacy, both physical and emotional intimacy that leads to either moving in together or getting married. What were the first things I shared in this? Social activities, hobbies, mutual interest. In fact, that is how a deep friendship is often built through the experience of activities. And for some people, that's one of their highest or their top love language. And I think it's important to recognize that what I'm about to share in these seven, you might want to embody all of them so you can have a full, rich relationship with another person. So we just talked about activities. Let's talk about the second one listed, and that is appreciation, aka, aka words of affirmation or adoration, as we Leos call it. Appreciation. If your love language is appreciation, you may feel most loved when your partner acknowledges and compliments you through Words, through words. See, I believe that words are critically important in relationship equal to actions. I think it's important to be able to, um, to express and acknowledge how it feels being with this person and certainly acknowledge, validate them, compliment them. Because then we, when we hear the words, it's again, for some people, it might just simply be the actions themselves, but I'm also here to encourage the actual words within a relationship because when we hear it, we most likely, and I say most likely because I can't speak for everyone, but for the most part, if you're capable of receiving the words, you feel most love. Now, I just said something critically important right there, receiving. See, here's the thing. Oftentimes, men and women struggle in relationship because they're unable to receive love. Some people are unable to give love. Some people are unable to receive love. See, to be in a healthy, happy relationship, to be in that kind of loving relationship, one must be able to not only give love to another human being, but also receive it. And why would someone struggle to receive love? Folks, if you've been on my channel for a while, you know I continually talk about childhood wounds and adult traumas that oftentimes block us to the capacity to love. I know in my own life, I had trauma growing up that made me very, not just fearful, but anxious to wanting to receive love because my mother had a way of abandoning us. I had something known as separation anxiety. Some of you might be familiar with this. And within, no matter what emotional trauma or physical trauma you experienced. And when I use the word trauma, I don't necessarily mean that there was something bad or intentional. Believe it or not, just a mother leaving a child's bedroom for a few minutes could create separation anxiety. And you could have had a loving mother and father. But all of these experiences that happen in our childhood or in our adult life, if you went through a contentious divorce, and you had to unravel the tapestry of your life with another human being. That is an emotional trauma. 
And given that roughly 75% of singles over 45 years old are most likely divorced, many of us have experienced a deep wound that makes it difficult to either give or receive love. And so it's no wonder we're dealing with a lot of emotional discourse out in the dating marketplace. So what are the other ways to make someone fall madly in love with you? Well, I'm here to talk about physical touch, physical touch. That's one of the other love languages in the books of the five love languages. Physical connection. Some people feel most seen, loved, and appreciated when you're in the physical contact with another person, partner, physically touching them. For some people, that's difficult to receive. For some people, that's difficult to give. And yet for others, this is a way we bond with another human being through physical intimacy. And when we feel a physical intimate connection with a partner, we feel more deeply loved. And while the book Five Love Languages suggests that we only have one or two or three, I'm here to suggest that when we hit all five in the book or all seven that I'm about to share with you, we feel deeply, more madly in love with our partner. And certainly physical touch is one of those things that I think we all crave to some degree. We all crave that level of connection at that more intimate level. So what's next on the list? Well, on the in the book, The Five Love Languages, it is gifts. It is gifts. Now, what's interesting in the seven love languages, they talk about financial, financial. And I believe this is actually critically important because for some people, feeling valued and special, they feel valued and special when their partner spends money on them. But this is a tricky one. Because just like gifts, that's certainly that extra special thing. But for some people, it's the continually support of reusing someone's resources. For some people, that's how they feel loved. As I said, this is tricky because it might go beyond just the gifts itself is talked about in the five love languages. But actually those that financially support someone, that might be how they feel loved. And certainly speaking as a man, by the way, as a man grown up with the traditional expectation that men are the provider protectors, men plan and pay for dates, I can tell you when someone, well, let me be really candid with you, after going through my divorce, being that provider protector, I did feel a bit, I don't want to use the word used, but I didn't think I felt appreciated being the provider protector. I'm going to be candid with you all. I don't, I didn't feel appreciated at that time in my life. So when a woman plans or pays for a date for me, I feel appreciated. I feel desired. I feel as though they're making an investment in me. This is why I'm a big proponent of people taking turns in the dating process. So there's an actual giving and receiving for one another. And I know this goes against the moral landscape or the traditional landscape. And yet at the same time, I believe when people use their resources, because money is a form of energy, when we actually invest in another person and they're capable of receiving it, some men are incapable of receiving your generosity. In fact, they might shame you or criticize you for making that investment in them. And it could quite be, or they might be so controlling that they don't want you to do that. But I'm here to suggest to you, if there is resistance when you are being generous from a financial perspective, be careful because that might be a capacity for that person not to be able to receive your love. And I just wanna put that in your consciousness. One of the other love languages in the book, The Five Love Languages, is acts of service. Now, what's interesting in the seven long, uh, love languages, they call this practical. If your love language is practical, you feel most love when your partner helps you in practical ways, doing chores, offering favors, just generally making your daily load a little bit lighter. They feel more loved when you're doing things for them. This is known as acts of service. I like this one, when we actually can help each other with chores, when we operate from a place of teamwork. 
I'm here to suggest that when couples work in a teamwork fashion, they have a greater bond with one another. It, it, it bonds them together when they operate as a team. Particularly, it might include going shopping together. It might be doing chores around the house. It might be help. one person has one responsibility in the home and the other person has another responsibility in the home. When they actually are actively helping one another in their lives, they feel a greater sense of love. So those were the five from the book, The Five Love Languages. There's two additional ones in the seven love languages. And like I suggested earlier, Google the seven love languages. You might find this rather interesting. So number six on the list is intellect. This love language involves, uh, involves a meeting of the mind. You value the ability to connect with your partner at a rational level. Now, this is also known as sapiosexual, sapiosexual. And if you are not familiar with sapiosexual, I highly recommend you checking that out. But there is something incredibly attractive when you can have a meeting of the minds, when you share the same ideologies with a person, you share the same philosophies with a person, when you can actually connect at that level you can feel a greater sense of love with your partner. And I think this is an incredibly attractive quality for me personally, because I'm attracted to a person's mind and I suspect you feel the same way. And you don't have to be a PhD to find them attractive. You'd be surprised. You know, I even think of my children when they were younger, they had brilliant minds and they weren't at school. And I'm talking about when they were 12, 13 and 14. I don't have to be schooled or educated to have a mind, a curious mind that actually can create perceptions that bring value in your life. I'm a big proponent that when a person seeks your opinion on something, that is probably one of the most attractive things when a person genuinely wants to understand how you feel about something, that is probably one of the most desirable things, at least in my book, and I'm hoping it's the same for you as well. And then number seven in this list, and again, this is no particular order, is an emotional love language. People that want to connect at a heart-centered level, that want to connect with your heart. I don't think enough attention is addressed in this area. I don't think enough attention is addressed in this area for a genuine and emotional connection. You know, I know many of you believe that men are emotionally unavailable. I'm here to disagree with that notion. I think many men have difficulty expressing their emotions. I think many men have difficulty expressing their emotions, but I can tell you men feel emotions just like women feel emotions. Men oftentimes stuff their emotions. And so I shared a moment ago about my friend Patty Tierney, her and her husband working, worked as couples counselors with many couples in my spiritual community. One of the things they did is to help the men in particular be able to emote, to dig deeper than the surface and to be able to express emotions. And so when I said earlier that relationships take work, I think part of that work is understanding the mechanics to a relationship, understanding the mechanics of love languages, understanding how to emote in each area of a love language so you can build deeper roots of trust in a relationship, deeper roots of trust. Now, oftentimes we think of trust in the form of fidelity or honesty or integrity. But to me, the deepest form of trust in a romantic relationship centers around your partner's needs. Your partner's needs are your best interests. In other words, it's in your best interest to meet your partner's needs, to care about their needs because it fulfills you. And by the way, I'm talking about two people doing this together, not a singular one person only doing this. When one person is filling all, is, is addressing their partner's needs and the other person's not doing anything, 
that person's getting a hard, a, a large return on their investment because they're making no investment. And this person's getting little or no return on their investment. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about meeting your partner's needs at a mutual level. And so when we address and understand the mechanics to how love works, the mechanics to a healthy, happy relationship, when we actually inquire about our partner's needs, we actually find a more fulfilling, madly in love type of relationship with another human being. And this is why I'm a big proponent. When two people engage in a relationship, the minute they become physically intimate, then start to study all of the unique aspects of how to make a relationship work. And if you haven't read the book, Eight Dates by Doctors John and Julie Gottman, I highly recommend reading this book. Do this because this lays out a foundation of the conversations you might want to have with your partner so you can build deeper intimacy with them. And ultimately, what most couples crave is a deeper form of intimacy. Is this sinking in? Is this resonating? Please let me know. So once again, I invite you at this point now to go Google the seven love languages right now. And again, this piggybacks from the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And I believe when you are hitting all seven and a couple, both couple, both people in the relationship and give and receive all seven, you're gonna find yourself madly in love with your partner. I can't imagine that this wouldn't happen when you're actually meeting your partner's needs in all seven areas. Again, is this sinking in? Is this resonating? Please let me know if it is. Post a comment below. I'd like to hear your thoughts. As always, if you find value in my videos, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you can be notified of new videos. And if you want to connect with me directly, Links below to schedule a discovery call with me, to join my group called Midlife Love Mastery, to follow me on Instagram, to get all the books I recommend, to get my dating vows all listed below. All right, those who know my live format, if you're on live right now and you have a question for me, write the word question in the chat box and then post the question there after. Or you can purchase a super sticker, super chat. All the monies from the super sticker, super chat goes to a scholarship fund in the name of my son, Connor Asley. Oops, that's a picture of him right there. It's my son who passed away over five years ago. And we donate to causes like the Hoffman process. And today we donated to Insight Seminars in his name. And also we give scholarships to coaching as well. So again, hit that little dollar sign. Our goal tonight is $50. We'd love to appreciate, we'd love if you could invest in the scholarship fund in the name of my son, Connor. Also, if anyone wants to join the Hot Seat Live, I just post a link, and this way you can connect with me directly right now live. All right, as we're waking, waiting for question, oh, Claire has a question. What if it's hard for a man to say, I love you? That's a good question. My suspicion is this person has some sort of wound in their childhood or in their adult life that makes it difficult for them to express the words. So you might want to inquire. This is called appreciative inquiry. May I ask, why is it difficult for you to say, I love you? Did you have a trauma in childhood? Did you have a trauma in your adult life that makes it difficult for you? Have you ever really been deeply in love before? See, most folks don't understand that many of you have thought you've been in love when you've actually experienced something known as love attachment. If you're not familiar with the book Attached by Amir Levine and Rachel Heller, you might find that you might not have actually experienced deep, genuine love with another human being. You might have found yourself in a relationship where you were attached to another person, believing that you were loving them. Now, could this just be semantics? Could it simply be that we're mixing apples with oranges? Many of you who follow me probably have children. If you have children, you know what it means to love your child. I'm, it's very rare that I've met, a, I've yet to meet a parent who hasn't deeply loved their child. Now, many of you have parents, but some of you don't love your parents. Some of your parents don't love you at this point in your life. 
So we can recognize the difference between love of a child, but we can also represent family within our lives that we may not love. And so this occurs oftentimes in relationships as well. We get attached to another human being thinking it might be love when there might be something else going on on an emotional level. And so I just invite you to explore this. So if someone has difficulty saying, I love you, there is probably a root cause or they haven't experienced deep love in their life before. I'm going to venture to say a lot of people haven't experienced true, genuine, romantic love with a partner. They might have experienced uh, love attachment. They might have been chasing the love of one of their parents through their partner. But I believe when we hit these seven love languages we are experiencing, when both people are experiencing it at a very high level, they are deeply and madly in love with each other. And again, that's my perception. You can take it or leave it. All right, let's keep going here. Anka, Anika says, how do you communicate to a man that I love intimacy and see, but that it is a scared or sac sacred experience for me that implies exclusivity. Last person said he did, but was not physically exclusive. You know, I'm not a big proponent of dating more than one person at a time. It's just how I feel. If I like someone and I would want, if by the time we've gone through a third date and we're going to see each other a fourth time, for me, I don't like to be distracted by other people. I'd like to get to know one person at a time. So now we can call that exclusivity or we could just call it dating one person at a time. It doesn't mean I'm fully committed to this person. It just means I want to explore a relationship with one person at a time. I'm a big proponent of that. Not everybody agrees with me. There are schools of thought. They call it duty dating. They call it circular dating, dating multiple people until the cream rises to the top. I'm not a big proponent of that. The reason why? Because the minute you get emotionally involved with someone, it's rather difficult to spread yourself thin. But more importantly, how can you build intimacy with someone if you're not getting to know one person at a time? So how do you express that? How do you communicate that? You simply say, I'm the person that dates one person at a time. I am physically intimate with only one person at a time. So when I'm engaging and getting to know someone, I prefer to be monogamous and exclusive. How do you operate? Oh, I like to play the field. I don't mind sleeping with a bunch of women at the same time. If a guy says that to you, are you aligned with one another? See, these are the types of, I was having a conversation with a woman yesterday. See, some people walk into a swimming pool tiny little steps at a time. I like diving in the deep end, getting into the middle, so to speak. Getting into some of those tougher conversations sooner just to see if we're on the same page. Because the minute you invest emotionally with another human being, you can get rather attached to someone. Sometimes in an unhealthy way, sometimes in a healthy way. So have the harder conversation sooner. Listen, if two people are kissing one another, that's a physically intimate act. If you're kissing one another, you have every right to ask the things that are most important to you. And Annika, that's my suggestion. See what happens next time when you go into the middle of the pool versus wading in very slowly. All right, hope that helps. Um, Catherine says, I see Jonathan's questions have reached a man, wait, question, have reached a man by talking the truth to him, but he has been three, has had been, has had three marriages. I'm paying attention to him, letting him talk. I'm not really sure the question there, but thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Gigi, I met a guy online. He was South he was south during the winter. When he got home, he reached out. He is, I can't, he is, I can't too busy. Shall I just say our lives are not aligned? If someone is unable to be with you, and if, if look at dating, well, my perception of dating is physically being in each other's orbit. If someone's unable to be in your orbit, 
I wouldn't hold space for someone until you've actually gone on a physical date with them. That's just my perception anyway, and I hope that works for you as well. Um, three cats. My boyfriend was abused, hit by his mother. She stole his money and at 18 went into the Marines to escape a horrible child life. Had no father either. I feel he's wounded. He treats me wonderfully. Certainly some people can take adversity and they adopt a very closed off relationship or maybe they adopt the exact opposite. That's certainly possible for some people. I'd be curious to know if he's able to receive your love. I understand he treats you wonderfully, but can he receive your love? That'd be a curious question I'd want to know the answer to, Three Cats. So can he receive the love you give to him? Because while it's wonderful to get to receive from another, it's also important that they have a capacity to receive as well. That's just my perception anyway. All right, let's keep going. Bum, 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 bum. Jane says, in my view, self-love, self-knowledge have to be present before we can love another person. Opinions and attitudes, cultural differences can affect chemistry as well. Absolutely. You know, we have our biological DNA that goes back all the way to cave person time. Let's just go back to Neanderthals a couple hundred thousand years. We have that imprinting in our DNA. We certainly have our cultural imprinting that happens. We have our imprinting from our parents and our childhood. Certainly another factor that plays into it is the socioeconomic environment we grew up in. Our religion can place a factor. Even our, our culture, depending on if we have parents, immigrant parents, or certainly here in the United States, if you have parents from another country, that can play a factor into it if they come from another country. Certainly their past experiences play a factor in their capacity to love with one another. And certainly their emotional awareness in relationship and their relationship skills, all of these play a factor into relationship success. So yes, I'm in full agreement that self-love is that capacity to be, self-love to me is self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-reliance, self responsibility, just to name a few. In fact, I wrote a book about it. It's a very simplistic book called What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? A Journey of Personal Development, Self-Help, and Spiritual Work. I guess, again, the link below to get a copy of my book. I highly recommend reading it. And if you liked it, please write a review as well. So yes, I'm a big proponent of introspection work to really look inward at your actions and say, how am I contributing to my experience versus pointing the finger at someone else? And just remember, when you point a finger at someone else, there's three fingers pointing back at you. <laughs> so just be aware of that. All right, if anyone wants to join the hot seat, I just put a link right there. Also, we'd love some kindness for the Connor Asley Scholarship Fund. Hit that little dollar sign and donate tonight as well. All right, let's keep going. Tracy's in the house. Is a relationship without arguments a healthy relationship? It's very rare that a couple will not have some differences or disagreements, okay? It's very rare. But I also recognize that that does occur. Two people can be rather aligned with one another. They could be hitting all of these seven love languages. And so there isn't much friction. I think some couples that have deeper friction, if they're fully committed and they're to one another and they can work through these threshold barriers, these storms that occur, it can build deeper intimacy with a partner. But I don't believe just on its own. Again, it's I have yet to meet the couple that haven't had at least differences. But they're just actually probably both have agreeable personalities. They're rather chill. It's not, I have to be right. See, oftentimes when there's a disagreement with your partner is I'm right, you're wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. No, 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 I'm right, you're wrong. When we get so entrenched in our beliefs, oftentimes there's no room 
to contemplate that someone else might have a different point of view. And yet I do believe there, there are couples that are rather open-minded. And while they might him and haw for a moment, they see the value of their partner's point of view. I think when we can acknowledge our partner's point of view and accept their point of view is true for them and recognize that, you know, in some cases you don't have to pick a battle. You can just simply say, you know what? I'm going to accept your point of view. And when two people can do that equally, I think they probably have less friction in relationship. That's just my perception overall on that. All right, let's keep going. Renee says, my boyfriend is obsessed with his ex-wife. Eight years, but I still have trouble walking away. But this eats my soul. I am so sorry. My sense is you've given your power away to this person. And you're accepting. If someone is constantly or obsessed with an ex-partner, then I invite you to ask yourself, why are you accepting this relationship? And my guess is that there's a self-worth component here that you don't feel you're worthy of someone who obsesses over you. Isn't that what love is partially obsessing over your partner? I don't mean in an unhealthy way. I'm talking about a healthy way. He's obsessing in an unhealthy way. But don't want you, don't you want your partner to be obsessed over you? And if they're obsessing over someone else, then ask yourself, why am I not worthy of that? Why do I believe I'm not worthy of that? Do the introspection work, do the self-love work, and maybe you might find a space to make a stand. I make a stand for my sovereignty. I make a stand to be with someone who actually obsesses and desires me fully. That's my invitation for you, Renee. And I'm sending you a big, gigantic Jonathan Bear hug. And hoping you feel that way about yourself. Because when you obsess about yourself in a healthy way, then maybe you'll recognize that to some degree, you are worthy of someone who feels that way about you. That's my invitation for you. Missy says, after living with a man, any other female turns him on besides you. I guess you're speaking about something else. Okay, Annika's back in the house. How do I answer a man that says he's attracted to me just because I'm from another country? I'm exotic to them. That is something that women immigrants experience a lot. How do I answer a man that says, you just simply say thank you? <laughs> I mean, if someone expresses attraction for you, be gracious, be grateful, you know? I know I was speaking to a gentleman the other day, a uh, very <laughs> Anglo-Saxon male, and he happens to like Asian women. I don't know why that is. It just happens to be. Sometimes we all have our type. I don't know where that, I don't know where types come from. Maybe in a past life, he lived in Japan. Maybe in a past life, he, he was, or, she, or he, maybe it was, he was a she, Asian at one time. That could be the reason why. I don't know, but I do believe some people have a certain type. Uh, I know some men like Latina women. Some people, some men like Asian women, like what I talk about. Some men like big butts and I cannot lie. And the other brothers can't deny when a girl walks in with the itty bitty waist, the round thing in your face, you get sprung. <laughs> Everybody has a type. If someone says that about you, just say thank you. If it, if it feels like a genuine compliment, then say thank you. All right, that's my two cents on that one. Hey, Annika just gave us a $10 super sticker. That means we're $40 away from our goal tonight. Um, Claire wants to ask me a private question. How can I ask you privately? You have to email my staff. at. Uh, you have to go to support at Understand Men Now. My assistant will send it to me. <laughs> All right. Hey, before I take Melanie's question in a moment, I have a share with everybody. Okay, write this down. Someone write this in the chat box. The show is called Unreal. Unreal. U-N, capital R-E-A-L, one word, Unreal. Uh, I believe it was on Lifetime Movie Channel. I, I I've been watching it on Tubi, T-U-B-I. -I. I do believe it's on um, YouTube or also Amazon Prime. 
it's a behind the, it's a spoof on the batch the bachelor okay it's a behind the scenes look at what it's really like at the bachelor from the producers and all the camera people and everyone behind the scenes and it is a real spoof on the show and it i'm already hooked i've watched two a client shared that with me today i've watched two episodes and i am absolutely hooked on it because i think it's the actual behind the scenes of the show the bachelor so someone write that down unreal I, i'm watching it on tubi but you may want to check it out i just think it's kind of interesting all right let's take melanie's question if I had or have an overbearing mother, if you had or have an overbearing mother and find it extremely hard to speak up, do I grow thick skin or keep reminding my boyfriend that I do not like to be mocked, albeit a gist? Well, I'm a big proponent that if there's friction in a relationship, it's important to speak up right away. In addition, you may want to get to the root of that experience with your mother and do a healing, whether it's for yourself, with your mother, because that's certainly that wound. Think about a wound. When you touch it, ouch, ouch. You, no, you don't even have to touch it and you feel ouch. So, and now his, see, he might have had a mother or father that was rather um, mocked him. Or there might have been something else in his childhood where he mocks mocks a person because then he feels more superior. So then he has a wound as well. And I think if you went to couples counseling together, maybe you could get to the root of it and actually connect with one another by talking about your individual experience with one another and maybe have a mutual healing with one another. So not to just simply say, I don't like to be mocked, but actually maybe speak with a professional to help you with the verbal tools. You may want to read the book, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg with your partner. If Here's the thing, ladies. If the penis is going inside the vagina on a regular basis, you have every right to seek additional help to make your we relationship stronger. And if someone is resistant of that, then how much do they really love you? How can they really, how can a partner love you if they're not willing to do the work to make for a better relationship? And or let's look at it this way. It doesn't even have to be about love. How committed are they to a relationship if they're not willing to do the work? It's because we live in this fucking fantasy that, oh my God, we have this amazing chemistry. It's so off the charts. We're just so wonderful together. This is the big fucking lie, everybody. It's a lie. Relationships take relationship skills. Relation, or let me reframe that. Successful relationship take relate requires good communication skills, and it requires a level of emotional maturity. So if you're aware that you have a wound from your childhood, and then he needs to be aware that he mostly has a wound. And so he does this because in his own little way, or excuse me, in his, his little kid inside of him wants to be loved as well. So if we can be introspective and look inward and say, I want to work on this relationship because I value this relationship, then you have a greater chance for a relationship success, Melanie. And my hope is that the two of you do that together. Okay, I'm sending you a big, gigantic Jonathan Bear hug of self-love. All right, June is in the house. Oops, let's do this again. Hi, Jonathan. Last time I brought up how society is losing third spaces and how it's affecting dating. You accidentally took it as applying to your course. Have you heard of third spaces issue? I have not heard of what third spaces is. I'm going to write this down. I have no idea what third spaces is, but I'll write it down and I'll Google it. If someone can write down what it is, I'll read it while we're doing our broadcast today. Ah, uh, Sharon's in the house. On dating sites and looking at men's profiles, I see some have don't know yet as what they're interested or looking for. I'm looking for a relationship. Should I just not bother with these guys? 
You know, I've noticed the same thing on women's profiles. So it's not singular to men, Sharon or Shannon. You know, I'm a big proponent that when a person is very clear they want commitment, they are more intentional in the process. There is a group of men in particular that operate, I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I see it. I learned this from um, Wayne Dyer. I operate from the place when I believe it, I will see it. When I believe it, I will see it. When I believe it. What I'm basically saying is some people, some men are just haphazardly dating, hoping that somehow some magic fairy dust with some unicorn out there will convert them from being non-committal to committal. That's the rolling the dice approach, okay? I would much rather be with someone who clearly knows they want a relationship and they're intentional about it. That's how I would approach the process. So when I see those women that don't know yet, swipe left, swipe left, swipe left. I send them love along the way, okay? Uh, let's keep going. Oh, Chris just gave us a $10 super sticker. Thank you so much. That means our, we have 30 more dollars to go for tonight. So thank you so much. Um, uh, once again, Melanie is letting us know about the unreal on Amazon prime Tubi or YouTube. I'm watching it on Tubi, which means I have to watch a commercial. I should just check it. I should have just checked to see if it was on Amazon prime. Ah, uh, bum, 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 bum. Unreal is the behind the scenes. Look at the bachelor. Oh, titanium rocks just gave us a $5 super sticker. That means we have only $25 left for tonight. That's our goal of 50. Melanie just gave us big hugs. I'm back at you. Thank you so much. MJ is in the house. I'm Catholic divorced. Approached by a Muslim man, separated, has four kids with wife as she has personality disorder and controlling issues. He is family oriented, hardworking and disciplined. MJ, you did not have a question, but thank you for sharing the particulars. If you have a question, let me know what it is. All right, let's keep going. And Melanie wants to ask MJ, are you sure he's uh, separated? <laughs> and it looks like he's legally separated. Okay, well, we got that. So what is your question, MJ? Let us know. What do you want to know? Um, let's keep going here. Third places are public spaces we enjoy. Home, work, first and second. Okay, third spaces, third places. I mean, you know what I've observed? So for those of us in midlife, many of us are rather set in our way. So recently I was talking to a, a client of mine that I worked with years ago. And... Um, and she was going through a relationship challenge. So I worked with her on her relationship, not about finding a relationship. And she's now reached a point, she's in her 50s. And she goes, I don't think I want to sleep in the same bed with anyone in the future. Like I like my own bed. And it's interesting because many of you know I was in a significant relationship. We lived together and I love sleeping with someone else. I loved having someone next to me. But in this woman's case, she's actually saying I'd prefer to have my own bed. And it made me think of back in the 40s and 50s when they had like a, a I love Lucy period of time where they had two twin beds in the bedroom. So it wasn't a master, master or excuse me, um, a king size bed is just two twin beds put together. But they had either two separate bedrooms or if you watched any shows where um has to do with the White House, the president and first lady actually have separate bedrooms. I'm not talking about our current president or not. I, I have no idea what their arrangements are, but I've seen it in shows where they had two separate bedrooms. So as we get into midlife, many people have their own way of doing things. It's one of the challenges why blending lives together is so difficult for some people that have their own set way. So I, I'm guessing third places or third spaces might have to be having your own space somewhere else. And I can see that could be um, 
It could either be problematic or a necessity in relationship. This is why a lot of couples don't move in together because they like having their own space. I recognize that. All right, let's see. Okay, so MJ does have a question. I want to know if he's doing the right thing, deciding to separate after four kids. You know, I certainly recognize that many couples feel an obligation once they have children to be there together to support the children until they're out of the home. And if they are operating from a conscious way, if they, let's just say there's no more romantic love, but they're doing it for the children, then my hope is that they treat each other with civility. They treat each other with kindness and care for the sake of the children. If they're treating each other very poorly, I think you even said that his, his, you said his wife has a personality disorder, then maybe it might be best for them to move on from one another because that's what's best for the children in a long-term perspective. I can't speak on his behalf because I don't know, but he certainly has to figure that out. The question is, what are you doing with a married man? I'm assuming he lives with his spouse the way you um, have put this narrative out there, and I'm just not a big proponent of that. Uh, ladies, dating someone who isn't... Okay, being in relationship with someone that isn't fully free is rolling the dice. And let me just tell you, it's trying to roll five dice at once and get all sixes at the same time. It's almost an impossibility. So Jonathan, you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> yes, there's always one in a million chance. But do you really want to take that risk with your emotional well-being? I'm not a big proponent of that. And I don't recommend that. Oh, you said he's moved out. Okay, well, I guess, well, again, um, you got to do what's right for you. Um, you know, I just hope that he's doing this separation or divorce civilly, and hopefully uh, you don't have to get entangled with his divorce. All right, Missy's in the house. How do you ask a man to show proof of legal separation and proof that his exes have mental issues without offending him? Well, I believe there are court records. You could go to the courthouse and look this up. There's usually a court record. How do you show proof? You just, you could ask for it. I think this is where, see, this is tricky. What is trust? If you simply made a request, would it be okay that you show me some sort of document documentation? He's going to say, you don't trust me. You can say, I've been hurt in the past. And I've had men lie to me. So this isn't an issue of trust. It's just by providing this. If it's, if it's true, then I don't think it'd be difficult for you to provide this for me. You have copies of the court, the documents that your attorneys have given to one another. But if you're hiding something from me, then, then I'm now even less trusting of you. But you have every right. If the penis is going inside the vagina, ladies, you have every right to ask for things. He can say no. Certainly that might discredit him. But then you have to make that decision for yourself. Missy, great question. Thank you so much. Brown Kanita says, good advice. Thank you. Coco says, don't date a married guy. They need to heal and get their crap together. I would agree with that. Folks, I once, this was uh, five months after my wife and I legally separated and I was on a dating site and I put down divorce because in my mind, the minute we moved out of the house, we were divorced. And by the way, for the record, um, we were... Um, it took two years for our divorce to get finalized after I moved out of the house. But I remember five months into my dating process, I had a woman say, how long have you been divorced? And I said, we've been legally separated for five months. And she responded back. She goes, reach out to me uh, in 18 to 24 months after your divorce. And you've had one to two transition relationship. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, well, you're not ready for a relationship. I said, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready for a relationship. She goes, well, these are my guidelines or my boundaries. Sure enough, three months later, I met a woman 
and really fantastic woman. I was gung ho. I want a relationship. I want a relationship. I want a relationship. And then three months in, I couldn't handle it emotionally. And I said, I'm not ready for a relationship. And she understood this. In fact, she knew it going in. She actually said, I'm dating you with rose colored glasses. And then I, I saw that same woman on a dating site two years later, and I wrote her back and I said, you were right. <laughs> I, she, I reminded her who, who I was, and I said, you were absolutely right. I needed two years and a couple transition relationships before I really understood what it meant to be in relationship with another human being. So anyway, um, so let's see. Annika's back in the house. What, what if someone is asking in the beginning of the relationship that we have password to each other's phones? Is that about building trust? You know, I think of my smartphone as my journal, okay? This is my space. It's not for anyone else. That's how I feel about it. Now, I don't have this password protected. And when I'm in relationship, it's on the kitchen table. And I could be gone from the kitchen table for hours. I have nothing to hide. But I would hope that I'm not putting my partner, I'm not creating a circumstance where they have to mistrust me to look at my phone. I feel as though my phone, as well as my partner's phone, is the equivalent of their journal. And a journal is, is our safe space. Because sometimes we have thoughts, sometimes we have things that we keep to ourselves. We Certainly our phone is a database of, of a lot of communication with people that might have existed years and years before our past relationship. In addition, I'm a dating relationship coach. I have intimate conversations with women all day long. It's part of a professional capacity for me. Now I'm unusual in that way, but I'm not a big proponent of giving each other passwords to one another. At the same time, I'm not hiding anything from anyone either. But you have to ask yourself, why? what is causing you to feel the need to look at my phone? I mean, since he's asking for it, what is causing you to want to look at my phone? I would be curious about that. Sounds like somebody already has trust issues. And if somebody has built-in trust issues, it's very difficult to heal that they have to heal that on their own, or at least I would prefer someone heal that on their own, because I don't want to be a punching bag for their past fears. That's just me anyway. But you have to answer that for yourself, okay? All right, Karen's in the house. What about when, a, when he comes back on the day he's getting married? He said he wasn't. He denied everything after cutting ties six months before, saying he was back with his ex. I'm so confused. Why are we ever entertaining a man who just got married to somebody else? I mean, like, why are we, why are you, why do you even care about why he did things? I invite you to look, why do you care? I'm here to suggest if someone is got married, well, if you've been in a relationship with someone and they just got married, I'd be angry as hell. And I'd cut that person out of my life. Again, I don't know exactly what's going on, but please, please walk away for your own sanity and stop. Don't even give him a moment's thought. Hillary wants you to know, Karen, please walk away. Hazel says, Karen, know your worth. Say thank you next. Exactly. All right. Let's see what else we have here. Bump, 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 bump. So um, I want to ask everybody, do you have a good male friend in your life? For the women, or, or by the way, opposite sex friend, let's just put it that way. For the heterosexual group, do you have a good opposite sex friend out there? Someone you can confide in. I believe having male company, if you're a woman, and having female company of your man, actually helps you tap into appreciating the opposite sex. A lot of people don't have opposite sex friends. Some of my dearest friends are women. 
I love the company of women. I love the company of my male friends too, but I love the company of women. I don't mean that like I want to be surrounded by women arm to arm. I just love, I, I love, I'm going to call it feminine energy. And you know, I'm not a big fan of that. So I'm curious, do you have male friends? Someone you can confide in, someone who gives you good advice. I think it's important to have those in your life. And frankly, if you choose a partner, they should appreciate that you have a friend that can actually care about your heart, that cares about your well being. I think that's the essence of friendship. So I'm just curious. It looks like Annika says, yes, one of my best friends. Uh, Stephanie says, my best friend is a guy, love him dearly. And I hope both of you, when you actually achieve a healthy, happy relationship, they can appreciate your friend as well. Hey, we've just completed an hour of this broadcast, the seven ways to make a man fall deeply in love with you. Just to recap it, I just want to share with you, Google the seven love languages. I invite you all to understand these seven love languages. And when you're actually embodying this, when two people embody these love languages from a giving and receiving perspective, I believe this actually forms a strong bond with another human being. And my hope is that for every one of you, you achieve that juicy, delicious, healthy, happy relationship where you're doing social activities, hobbies, mutual interests, you're spending time with family and friends, you're traveling together, you're doing teamwork building skills, both in your personal and your professional life. You have intimacy, both physical and emotional intimacy that leads to something significant like moving in together, getting married. God, universe, spirit, I invite that for everyone who's watching today and myself included. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Hey, if you found value in this conversation tonight, please post a comment below. I'd like to hear your thoughts. As always, if you find value in my videos, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you can be notified of new videos. As always, if you want to connect with me, there's links below to schedule a discovery call, to join my group called Midlife Love Mastery, to... Um, to get the books I recommend, to follow me on Instagram, to get my dating vows all listed below. Definitely like to connect with you. All right, we're going to wrap up this video as I always do. First off, give myself a big gigantic Jonathan Bear hug. I'm going to reach into the camera and give you a hug of love if that's okay. I'm going to ask you to turn to someone, a pet, a teddy bear, a pillow. Give it or them a hug of love because hugs are a great source of love. And let's face it, we could all use more love in our lives. I want to thank McCoy, Oak Hill Farm, Claire, Melanie, Elena, True Morris, MD. Emerald, Joan, Mar Marnie, Mari, Hillary, Catherine, Stephanie, Annika, Coco, everyone who donated tonight, Hazel, Gigi, Karen, uh, ba, 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 ba. MJ, thank you for your questions, Missy, Brown Canita, everyone, big hugs, thanks a bunch, wishing you super duper fab evening. Bye now.